I'm Caroline Hyde. This is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, the tech earnings season heats up with Alphabet, Microsoft and Intel reporting this week. This is the Dow clocks in above 20,000. Plus, Verizon targets charter communications. The deal would make it the largest internet provider in the United States. But will it help Verizon keep pace with rival AT&T? And Cisco swoops in. CEO Chuck Robbins tells us how its $3.7 billion acquisition of App Dynamics terminated the first major tech IPO of 2017. First to our lead, a huge week for tech earnings with Alphabet, Microsoft, Intel, Qualcomm all reporting. And this, of course, in a week where the Dow Jones Industrial Average marched beyond the 20,000 level for the first time. Let's kick things off with Alphabet reporting on Thursday and our conversation with Adderall President Adam Burke and Bob O'Donnell of Tech Analysis Research. Take a listen. You have to take a step back. Here's a company that makes massive amounts of money, has massive levels of growth, and yet, yeah, people are finding those little areas. You know, the problem is always about expectations here. And, you know, obviously we'll talk more about this, but the ad ratio, the click numbers, you know, the amount per click is, is clearly a challenge for them. But what's good is we're seeing them spending money on some of these other bets that I think will pay off in the long run. In the short term, sure, there's a lot of extra money being spent, but I think they have a number of very interesting opportunities. I mean, Google recognizes that they have to extend, or Alphabet, pardon me, uh, has to extend beyond, you know, the, the advertising mo business model. And these bets, slowly but surely, uh, are going to start to pay off, and I think we're starting to see some of those signs of spending in those areas that we'll see growth later. We'll dig into those in a moment. Let's dig into the advertising revenue element with it, you, Adam, because I'm seeing cost per click falling 15% this time round, but they're still managing to lure in more people to buy those adverts. Yeah. They're going up about 36%. Is it a worry that people aren't paying up for each click so much? Well, to a degree, the declining cost per click is a continuation of the trend that we would expect as people move to mobile. Um, conversion rates are still lower on, on mobile devices, so therefore the advertisers that are marketing those businesses are less inclined to pay up for clicks that happen on mobile devices. So that, that's all more or less uh, to be expected. I think the bigger question is around the click metric in general. Yeah. Um, we're hearing from a lot of our customers that they're sort of starting to question how valuable are clicks Overall, explain that because we're not you don't have to click on ads anymore. Right. Well, I mean, especially you know, so obviously the search engine is Google's cash cow and has been for some time, and the d default behavior uh, for an ad on a search engine is to click it and to click all those blue links. Um, in YouTube, it's very different. You're viewing an ad, and so that, that that could be a very good thing for Google. You're opening up to a whole new range of use cases, a whole new range of different verticals. You don't tend to click convert c click convert to buy. Uh, laundry soap, for example, mm -hmm. uh, unless you're shopping on Amazon. So th that can open up a CPG category and things like that. But th the whole click metric is going to end up getting a lot of noise the, the bigger uh, and the more important YouTube gets as a, as a share of the total. Talking to that, interesting, we're just hearing from Sundar Pichai, of course, CEO of the Google element of the business. And he is saying that key trends powering Google at the moment, machine learning, three biggest bets. YouTube is their yeah. first one, cloud and hardware. Let's dig in with you, Bob, a little bit more about the cloud and the hardware. I was impressed. Cloud, they say, is their big, fastest growing area of the business, but they got tough competition when you're looking at Amazon and Microsoft. Well, they do. And of course, Microsoft also showed big growth in their Azure business. So, uh, but look, it's a very large area. There's a lot of opportunity for everybody. This is definitely a case of, uh, you know, raise all boats kind of thing. And so I think we'll see Google continue to explain expand that cloud business, and as they can start to leverage some of their machine learning, some of their AI kind of capabilities, integrate that into their cloud offering, that offers a great way for them to differentiate somewhat from both what Microsoft and Amazon are doing. Now, both of those companies are doing that as well, but each one has their own special sauce and special flavor. Mm. Uh, and then on the other bet side, I mean, look, this is a company that is heartily dependent on one area, and for a lot of people, it does raise some concerns long term, like, well, how long can they possibly sustain that so let's look at what they're doing they spent a lot of money advertising the pixel right that's part of the reason why those costs were so high three billion more. but we all we've all seen the ads now right it's a nice piece of hardware Google home looks like a very nice piece of hardware they've got daydream on the VR side there's a number of very interesting areas that they're starting on they're gonna take a while but they're clearly laying a foundation to do some nice growth in hardware and additional services on top of that hardware and 
back to the YouTube element of the business, you think this could actually become the powerhouse going forward, do you? I mean, wh when does it start to show its dominance? Because we can't, act, they don't really break it out for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely think it's a huge opportunity. And I think, I think where people actually get it somewhat wrong or diminish the opportunity is thinking of it simply as TV dollars moving to online video. And that's not all it is. It's actually a growing the pie scenario because there are all sorts of businesses where the owner maybe has an iPhone 7 and can create a quick video and then promote that on YouTube and uh, Facebook, for Google example. Google hope it might be a pixel. Yes, exactly, yeah. Um, but that's an example of, a, of, a, of an advertiser who, who never would have bought a TV ad. So sure, all of those TV ads are likely gonna move towards digital over time, where consumers are spending time on YouTube, so that's all great. And it also opens up a whole new set of demand because of the lower friction and, and uh, lower barrier to entry uh, for digital video. That was AdRoll President Adam Burke and Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis Research. Speaking of Alphabet, well, the company's ended its 12-year relationship with one of Washington's most prominent lobbying groups. The Podesta Group is no longer lobbying on behalf of Google. The lobbying group has long-standing ties to the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton. This change coincides with Google's bid to hire someone for conservative outreach. And of course, as the Republican administration takes the White House. Staying on the earnings beat this week, SAP raised its targets for 2020, citing a surge in customers purchasing the latest suite of applications at a faster pace. The updated outlook came out with the company's fourth quarter sales, which were in line with estimates. SAP is transitioning from software installed on customers' computers to online cloud computing tools. CEO Bill McDermott spoke with Bloomberg TV about the company's strength in the U.S. marketplace. Clearly, any enterprise company operating in the global economy is almost always running SAP. So we like to think that our purpose in the United States will only get stronger because we can help the, the new president take cost out of the equation where it should and focus on growth where it can. And that's why you need global players like SAP to be great partners. And we will be. Still ahead, App Dynamics was on track to be the first major US tech IPO. That was before Cisco decided to snatch it up this week. We speak with Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins on the acquisition later this hour. And another possible mega deal this week as Verizon approaches Charter about a possible tie up. All the details ahead. This is Bloomberg. And now to some big deal news of the week. Verizon Communication CEO Lowell McAdam has approached Liberty Media CEO Greg Meffey about a possible tie-up with Liberty's charter communications. A Verizon charter combo would create a telecommunications and cable giant, vaulting the combined company to the number one spot in U.S. Internet providers. Here is some of the background behind this move. A combination of Verizon and Charter wouldn't be a merger, it would be a mega merger. And it's not the first one we've seen recently. Like AT&T's $109 billion bid for Time Warner, and Charter's own recent moves acquiring Time Warner Cable and Bright House Networks last year. Now valued at $103 billion, those acquisitions made Charter the second largest cable operator in the US, just behind Comcast. Currently, Verizon is the number one mobile carrier and number two telecommunications provider, but the company has been facing a slowdown in its core wireless business. This proposed deal would bring together thousands of miles of fiber optic internet capacity at a time of soaring demand for faster broadband. A tempting asset as the industry gets more saturated and consumers cut the cord. Quite a bit of information to go through on this potential tie-up. Joining us from New York is Walter Pysik, who covers telecom, media and tech sector for BTIG and has a neutral rating on Verizon. Welcome to the show, Walter. Thank you for your time. And Verizon numbers, as we saw this week, weren't looking too pretty in terms of the earnings. Would this tie-up be helpful? Would Charter cure their ills? Well, the tie-up with Charter wouldn't cure the ills of the wireless business, which is having some issues. Their competitors are offering unlimited plans, and Verizon has resisted that probably because they have 100 million customers, and it's unclear if the network could handle that type of usage. So buying Charter, and people have talked about some of the fiber that they have in adding 5G, that's in a section of the market. It's unclear how high quality the assets are that Charter has that would enable 5G versus for perhaps Comcast, who has much better I think fiber investments has been have made historically. Um, so it doesn't really shore up anything. It just kind of adds a different 
a different business and, and one that obviously generates its own free cash flow. I think what's interesting here is we're starting to see perhaps a division in the ranks of what the best tactic is for the future. You've got AT&T and Time Warner saying content is king and here we seem to see a deal that wants the infrastructure but you're saying the infrastructure isn't really up to much. Well, for a while, the CEO of Verizon, Lowell McAdams, strategy was go all wireless, and they were shedding a lot of this fixed stuff. And then all of a sudden, you have this issue where maybe wireless is not the best thing or the only thing for them to do. So there seems like there's a lot of pressure uh, on the company in order to make some type of changing transaction for them. I think your own uh, Bloomberg's own Alex Sherman talked today about them looking at 10 companies. That makes a mm -hmm. lot of sense to us, where basically they've got issues in the wireless business there's a whole host of companies that they're looking at. And now, with the new administration, there there's, tends to be this anything goes mentality where you can really perceive of any type of transaction at this point, it seems like, right? Maybe not an AT&T Time Warner one if we're to believe Trump for the time being, but what about, what about the 10 other companies that Verizon could be looking at? Who would be a good fit in your point of view? Well, if they're interested in fiber, then Zeo, which has 116,000 fiber root miles, would make a lot more sense if they want to actually fix their wireless business or have enough capacity and hurt T-Mobile's ability to get capacity, uh, then they should, they should buy Dish. If they want to get content, maybe they should look at Disney. If they want to, to diversify uh, the slowing business that they have and get more slowing businesses and more diverse, maybe they should look at Vodafone. I mean, there's so many different options that I think Verizon um, could look at going forward here. Um, the fact that, that they're talking to Charter is, is um, I, think, I think it's interesting, it's not really surprising given the challenges that they face. And the bigger question then is for Comcast, if we are yeah. in anything goes, if we are in an anything goes environment, why shouldn't Comcast also be looking at Charter? And maybe this whole conversation with Liberty is just Liberty saying to, to Comcast, hey, why don't you guys come and take a look at us before this spectrum auction is over and really all these deals start to, uh, to, start to, to uh, gather some pace. So regulatory hurdles, are you foreseeing fewer for um, amid this new administration or is the land not quite clear yet? The land, the land is not clear. Look, DOJ theoretically should have major issues with a Sprint T-Mobile transaction and yet the market seems to think with great confidence that that transaction can get done. At the, on the FCC side of things, um, with Ajit Pai as, as our new chairman of the FCC, I think the perception is probably rightly that um, there's not going to be as much problem with, with transactions or the FCC using the power they have to evaluate these things based on uh, the public interest. But look, the DOJ is a, meth a methodical type of organization, so we're skeptical that, that if Sprint T-Mobile actually tried it, uh, that they'd be successful. But hey, look, if we're wrong and the market's right, then again, why shouldn't Comcast be looking at Charter right now? We have to get back to earnings now as it was a main story in tech this week. Bloomberg editor at large Corey Johnson joined us along with Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis Research to dig through the takeaways. The Azure business continues to grow for them, uh, nearly doubled, uh, and you know there's no sign of that slowing down. There's a huge opportunity out there, um, as we discussed briefly before, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft all driving this business. A lot of interest there, and we're seeing each of these vendors, and Microsoft in particular, trying to focus on adding some interesting artificial intelligence, uh, speech recognition capabilities, so that other developers can take advantage of this on uh, if they're going to use Microsoft's cloud services. So we're going to see a lot more exciting developments in that area. The Office 365 business is very interesting as well because they've successfully moved from this model where we all used to pay you know, for a copy of Office mm -hmm. to now where we pay a subscription. And in the long run, that obviously has some nice financial benefits. So we're starting to see some of the opportunities that they're driving from that as well. And interestingly enough, even the Windows business uh, did okay. Uh, that old chestnut. Yeah, that old chestnut still uh, actually had some opportunity. And then, of course, they're heavily involved with gaming. Uh, that's a hot area as well. So they're, they're nicely positioned, I think, as we move forward. Something that the CEO has put into play. But what about the acquisition LinkedIn, Corey? Did we get any hints as to how that's going to start being adding to LinkedIn. our share? <laughs> I'll be linked yeah. to the results. They, they, uh, they're, they're very much separate businesses now. The mm. question is how long is that going to be the case? So Microsoft, more than almost any other company that has survived, has screwed up merger after merger after merger after merger going back decades. So can this one be any different? They, of course, they certainly hope so. Their plan is to keep this as a very separately operated company. So the results, of course, in the first quarter that it's consolidated is yeah. going to be separate. But the question is how much linked is it going to be in the future uh, upon full Fully intended. 
Well, you know, the one thing I would just to jump in briefly is that with Office 365, there is a very interesting mix between some of the LinkedIn capabilities with Office. As you tie contact information from Outlook and other things into LinkedIn, that seems like a reasonable mix. So we'll see what happens. But. More sales potential there. What about Intel? Because I know you've been all over these earnings yeah. today, Corey. Intel results are really interesting because, uh, you know, with all the companies we're talking about today, right, Microsoft, uh, um, uh, Alphabet, Intel, we're, we're talking about this seismic change in computing of moving uh, from companies buying lots of equipment to companies borrowing equipment and doing it over the cloud. Yeah. And so what you saw from the Intel results is Intel trying to wrestle with that issue, where they have this fantastically profitable business. As a PC industry is contracting, their server business also very profitable, yeah. trying to move into a lower margin environment uh, uh, where they're going to have Internet of Things, more modems, more memory. So when I talk to the CEO, Ian King and I, the, our terrific semiconductor reporter, we got on the phone with the, the chief financial officer, and, and what he had to say to us about the, the PC market was interesting, because Intel saw rising sales into a shrinking market with PCs. So he said, as we enter the year, we've got a somewhat cautious view for the PC TAM for the, the total addressable market. In other words, they expect PCs to continue to contract, and they're worried about that, yeah. but at the same time, they think that their data center business uh, might be strong. So when they look at uh, the ways that, how can they guide towards uh, basically flat margins and some uh, and growth that's, that's, that's still growing, in, you know, as they sell in a shrinking industry, that's by selling better stuff in the data centers and by trying to keep those margins together on the, on the other side. So when he said, we expect ASP to perform, the average selling price to be a little bit better for all of their products as they bring new products for the data center business. Then he looks down market though and says, but at the same time, we're looking at higher growth for low margin products of memory modem. So they'll have more low margin, which will, make, which will have to uh, hurt their high margin business uh, on the data center side. That was Bloomberg Editor-at-Large, Corey Johnson and Bob O'Donnell of Technalysis Research. Coming up, China's biggest internet giants are vying for the attention of smartphone users for the Lunar New Year holiday. We'll take you inside Tencent's headquarters in Shenzhen for a closer look at its mobile payment strategy. And a reminder that all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. It seems Samsung isn't the only company with battery issues. HP has recalled over 100,000 lithium-ion batteries used in laptops. This recall isn't new, but instead an expansion of the 41,000 recalled back in June 2016. The Consumer Product Safety Commission stated that the reason for the recall is possible overheating that can pose fire and burn hazards. HP says it'll provide a free battery replacement for each verified eligible battery. Now, the Chinese Lunar New Year tradition of handing out cash-stuffed red envelopes has entered the 21st century. It's migrated to the smartphone, with millions of people expected to send gifts digitally this year. According to Tencent, WeChat's parent company, users sent more than 8 billion digital red envelopes in one day last year, with mobile transactions more than doubling to $235 billion. Bloomberg News reporter Tom McKenzie went inside Tencent's headquarters in Shenzhen. <laughs> Chinese New Year is a boon for China's mobile payment companies, thanks in large part to the digitization of this centuries-old tradition. Well over a billion mobile transactions are expected this year as people fire off virtual red envelope cash gifts via their phones. Valued at just $32 million in 2012, China's mobile payment market was worth $1.8 trillion last year, according to iResearch. Tencent's WeChat and Alibaba-affiliated Ant Financial's Alipay are the two big rivals in this space. Their apps allow you to do everything from buying a latte to taking out a personal loan. It's all about getting an edge. In recent years, we've seen many players emerging in the mobile payments markets, including commercial banks and other third-party payment platforms. The competition here is so fierce, it's almost brutal. With more and more Chinese embracing mobile payments, Alipay and WeChat have come to dominate with around 90% market share. And that has drawn the attention of regulators who are expected to ramp up controls 
this year. The People's Bank of China wants companies like Ant Financial to register their deposits at state-owned banks. It's also developing its own cryptocurrency that could be used in online transactions. We follow all the regulatory guidelines of any institution offering financial services. And as that adapts, which it has continuously adapted and no doubt will continue to adapt, uh, we adjust our model to reflect uh, what the regulations require. China's banks are certainly feeling the pain. Market research firms estimate lenders here lost about $22 billion in payment revenue to Alipay and WeChat in 2015. That disruption isn't stopping at China's borders. And Financial is trying to capitalize on the 150 million Chinese who travel abroad every year, teaming up with vendors in key tourist destinations to provide their services. It's also invested in India's PayTM and is eyeing further expansion elsewhere. So I think you'll see most of the activity in this region, um, but we look very closely at the US, at Europe, uh, and what's the right strategy there as well. And so we really do have a, a global perspective and global ambition, and uh, we'll roll that out as we determine the right partners and, and move forward with them. China's mobile payment giants are on a roll, but succeeding abroad is likely to be their biggest challenge yet. Bloomberg News reporter Tom McKenzie joins us live now from Beijing. Thank you for getting up so early for us, Tom. And give us, uh, you talked there in the piece, you interviewed a lady who said about the brutal competition that there was. Who are the key competitors now to the likes of Alipay and to WeChat and, and how are they tackling with it? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, there is a lot of bloodletting between both WeChat and Alipay, and WeChat has expanded its market share in 2014 uh, from around 11% to around 20% last year, whereas Alipay has seen its market share fall off from about 82% to 68% in the same period. And then, of course, you've got the other competitors, as you pointed to. So Apple Pay, they launched. We've also got Huawei, the big smartphone maker here in China. They've got their own payment system. Samsung, of course, Android. But also the internet search company here, Baidu. They've got their Baidu wallet and JD.com, which has got JD Finance looking at the wealth management side of things. In terms of what Alipay and WeChat are offering, they've got this ecosystem, so apps within an app that makes it very, very easy to use their mobile payment systems to do all these sorts of different things, whether that is managing your wealth or buying flights uh, to travel abroad. So for the challenges, they have to take on that element of things. In terms of Apple, yeah. of course, they've got the brand strength here, still a very popular smartphone maker, uh, but they, uh, they use these NFC codes rather than the QR codes that are so popular in China, and it's mostly in-store purchases and purchases for apps. So it's going to be a challenge for Apple to carve out market share here. And quickly, Tom, you mentioned about global expansion, India. What's happening there? So Alipay have been leading the march on this one. They've teamed up with banks in Europe, particularly Barclays, BNP Paribas. You can now use Alipay in stores in London like Harrods and Selfridges. They've also teamed up with Verifone in the US. So Alipay making a big push on this. Again, it comes down to branding and brand recognition. Have they got that, that clout and can they take on the likes of Apple Pay in the US? That's going to be a key challenge for them. For the moment, they're focused on that huge number of Chinese tourists that travel abroad every year, 150 million as it stands. That was Bloomberg News reporter Tom McKenzie from Shenzhen, China. Up next, App Dynamics IPO was officially squashed this week. We'll dive into what this means for 2017's pending batch of tech IPOs next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can now listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. Now, Cisco is making an acquisition. The world's biggest maker of networking gear is acquiring App Dynamics for $3.7 billion. Cisco snatched the software maker just before it planned to go public this week. It was scheduled to price the initial public offering Wednesday in this year's first major U.S. technology IPO. Bloomberg's Daybreak America team spoke to Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins on the news. Take a listen. Yesterday was a great day for us, uh, and uh, we had 
you know, on display two great levers of how we drive innovation in our portfolio. In the morning, we launched a Cisco Spark Board, which will fundamentally revolutionize, you know, meetings in business. And one of the headlines was that it was the coolest product that Cisco's ever built. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we made the acquisition of App Dynamics, which we think is a tremendous synergistic acquisition for us. And if you look at App Dynamics, it's uh, it's a cloud-based application performance management system, but in reality what they do is they translate application performance into business insights for the customer, and they do it across both private cloud and public cloud. And so we think that the synergy of what we see at the infrastructure level and what they see at the application layer actually creates visibility that no other company in the industry can provide to our customers. So we're uh, we're very excited about it. I was there yesterday, 15 minutes after we made the announcement, I, I uh, addressed the, uh, the employee base and uh, I think they're pretty excited as well. So it was a good day for us. So, so good for you, but I have a couple of questions about the deal itself, because you paid a pretty good price, I mean, pretty high price, I should say, $3.7 million of reports that the IPO was going to go in for something like half of that. And also, it is a startup, and so it is not, as I understand it, making money. Is it dilutive? Is the price right? And at what point does it become accretive? Well, David, when we looked at the uh, company, there's a few things that, that we looked at that I think are important for us to understand. First is, they are absolutely the best company in this space. Uh, secondly, they're growing twice as fast as their nearest competitor. Third, they're growing faster than any publicly traded software company today. That was Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins. Now, staying with Cisco's latest acquisition, the record-breaking sale values App Dynamics at about 18 times the company's revenue in the past 12 months. That's good news for investors, and I'm very pleased to say joining us now is one of those investors, Ashim Chananda. He is a partner at Greylock Partners, who co-led Series A, Series B rounds, and App Dynamics. Ashim, I have to say, hats off to you. Congratulations, because how much did you put in the Series A, and what is the reward? I think the Series A investment uh, back in uh, April 2008 was, uh, the total round was about five and a half million dollars. And I think the company was valued, valued at about 12 and a half million at the time. And you know, two venture firms put in uh, 2.75 uh, 2 million each. So it's valued at 11 and a half million dollars. It is now valued at 3.7 billion. That must be such a reward for you. And uh, how, did this take you by surprise? How long was this, we understand there were talks with Cisco late at night in hotels. When did you get the offer on the table? So we actually signed the agreement with Cisco literally minutes before it was announced yesterday. Wow. So, uh, you know, we, we were really proceeding down the path to be a public company. Uh, and, you know, I think the strong belief within the company's management team and the board that this could be a multi-billion dollar business looking forward. And, uh, you know, Cisco and the company did know each other. And, uh, you know, a few days ago, you know, Chuck, the CEO at Cisco, uh, invited the CEO of App Dynamics over to his home. And that led to some very, you know, intense conversations. And, uh, you know, with Cisco's management team and, uh, uh, and I think the, you know, and, and the App Dynamics team, you know, uh, you, know uh, you know, came to the conclusion that, you know, merging with Cisco, you know, could really help accelerate the mission of the company and, you know, gain market share much, much faster. If it had listed, do you think it would have got to a $3.7 billion valuation anytime soon? You know, it's hard to really tell uh, exactly just because we didn't go public, but uh, the IPO roadshow was very, very strong. Within a couple of days, the offering was completely oversubscribed. So, you know, the best data we have is that if we had got public tomorrow, uh, it would have been a very, very strong IPO and would have likely traded up. So. I, th I think it's fascinating. I mean, you've been on the board of App Dynamics. In fact, Greylock helped this company grow, it was the first offices that were provided. They were working in Greylock with you when this company was first born in 2008. Do you, do you think, apart from the price tag, Cisco is the right way to go rather than listing? Uh, you know, I think, I think every company has to make uh, their own determination on whether they continue as a public company or go, uh, you know, or are acquired at some point in their life uh, cycle. Uh, I mean, Cisco is clearly a world-class technology company with, uh, you know, world-class, uh, you know, reach, a world-class management team, just incredible resources. So, uh, you know, I think Cisco can be just an excellent home for App Dynamics, uh, both in terms of extending reach for the product line very, very quickly, you know, across the world's largest enterprises, and also in terms of synergy, you know, with the infrastructure monitoring data that Cisco has. So combining, combining that data with the application and business performance data that App, App Dynamics has today can be really, really powerful looking forward. What does this say to the highly valued unicorns 
that are out there at the moment looking at the market, wondering whether to IPO, wondering whether to go to be acquired. Do you think this might put off others going public? Uh, I don't think so because I think actually, you know, uh, the indication uh, from the roadshow that the company undertook is that uh, the public markets seem to be very, very open and very receptive for, for the best technology businesses. Uh, I, was, I was in the roadshow, you know, the group lunch in San Francisco just two days ago, and it was standing room only. I mean, the room was full of public market investors. There was a very rich dialogue going on. So, uh, you know, just this morning, my email's full of uh, email uh, messages from a number of public market investors around the country just saying, hey, congrats, but saying, like, we, re we really wanted to kind of, you know, purchase stock in this company. With the first major tech IPO of the year down the drain, well, what's next for tech companies pondering going public? Will this spark a flurry of tech M&A? We caught up with PwC US technology deals leader Totson Page and Bloomberg's IPO reporter Alex Barinka. <laughs> Cisco did come in at a valuation, $3.7 billion. It's a lot higher than the $1.7 billion, which was the high end of the market value they were going for. But this is not a common occurrence. We saw Blue Coat last year get bought by Symantec, but they weren't on the road yet. This company, AppDynamics, had done all of their meetings. They had done their road shows. Investors were excited, and I guess Cisco was more excited and willing to pull the trigger on, on, a, on a buyout. And Susan, could this become a theme? Could road shows just make it all the more hot? for bigger tech companies, rivals to buy in and take them off the market? This coming year, there's a lot of companies in the IPO pipeline. There's 30 or 40 companies that we're expecting uh, have a good chance to come out this year. Uh, but we purposely uh, use the language that they will have an exit this year. That doesn't necessarily mean they'll have an IPO, but they will have an exit. And I think a lot of those companies, especially if you get into the mid-range of the valuation uh, group, not the, the big names that you see, but the next tier down, I think a lot of those companies are absolutely willing to do a dual track and see what their options are. If we stick with one track and the IPO track, I know there's one man out there who's rather hoping that this doesn't become a theme. And we did speak to Tom Farley, the head, the president of NICE earlier. Have a listen. We're expecting 10 IPOs in the next three weeks, including four on Friday, three operating uh, company uh, IPOs and a uh, closed-end fund. And by the way, those 10 IPOs, they're really big IPOs. Alex, this must have got bankers concerned. It, it does. And the IPOs, the deals that Tom is talking about, those are a lot of big sponsor back companies outside of tech mm -hmm. that we've been waiting to see for a while. Laureate, Geldwin, an education company, a window and door maker. They're kind of clearing Sexy out. Stuff. Exactly. They're clearing out the pipeline because last year was so choppy in equities, and now we have this Trump rally, and so people are taking advantage of it. It's a different story with some of these growthier tech companies. Yeah. What I'm hearing is the investors really, really want into them. They really want to buy into them, but there's no supply, and there's still no supply. We've heard about all of these companies going public, but it'll be interesting to see who does kind of test the waters next. Our sources tell us MuleSoft could be one of the next ones that goes in the next few months here. So all of these smaller names, but you know, to your point, they are also the ones that when the strategics finally feel like they're willing to write the checks that, um, that make the valuations that they raised in their last private rounds, these are the same kind of enterprise companies that we might see get bought out by the likes yeah, of Cisco. I agree. And I mean, if, if you look at last year, again, it was a record year after a record year. But there was something really interesting about that record last year. A lot of the big name technology companies weren't the ones who were doing the buying. I mean, nothing from Facebook, nothing that's from right. Amazon. I mean, you go off all the traditional serial acquirers, they weren't actually buying. So they, the pool is becoming wider. And, and, and yet they've got the funds to do it. They are interested and they see a lot of these companies bringing disruptive technologies. You're looking at cloud, you're looking at AI, especially with an AI machine and deep learning. Those are attractive assets that are disrupting every industry. And so it's not even just uh, the, the Cisco's or the HP's, et cetera, of the world. It could be the Walmarts, it could be the Ford, it could be the P&G being uh, an acquirer of these companies as well. Now coming up, more on President Trump's meetings with business leaders at the White House this week. How some tech companies are aligning themselves with the administration. Plus, President Trump is making good on his pledge to take down his predecessor's prized initiatives. But there is one Obama effort impacting tech that may be embraced by the new administration. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg.
President Trump met with business leaders at the White House on Monday morning, showing that U.S. job creation is a top priority. Tech companies around the world are eager to align themselves with the new administration. Let's focus on two of them, Foxconn and IBM. First, Foxconn, the biggest manufacturer of Apple devices, may build a U.S. factory for upwards of $7 billion. That's a major investment for the Taiwan-based Foxconn that could create tens of thousands of jobs in President Trump's first year in office. And then there's IBM. It pledged to hire 25,000 workers over the next four years. But a new report from Bloomberg found Big Blue cutting jobs as it touts its hiring plans. We discussed President Trump's job agenda in a roundtable with David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy, Bloomberg Gadfly columnist Tim Culpin, and Bloomberg TV editor-at-large Corey Johnson. Alternative facts are not limited to White House press conferences, apparently. Uh, the notion that IBM is hiring and making press releases, uh, indeed talking at Trump Tower, meeting at Trump Tower at that time with President-elect Donald Trump, talking about uh, adding jobs and spending a billion dollars to do so. But at the same time, as Bloomberg News has reported, the company has been cutting jobs and cutting them uh, rather aggressively. In fact, if you look at, at the number of employees for this company, what we've seen, well, there's, look, right there we're seeing pictures of Ginny Romney at Trump Tower, as I mentioned. Uh, she was part of the president's transition team. It looked really good to have that company out with a press release saying that they'd be hiring more in the U.S. and that they'd be spending a billion dollars in worker training. Uh, and yet, nonetheless, what we see IBM doing is actually cutting. The number of employees has been declining uh, dramatically over, the, over her tenure uh, as, as, as CEO, as well as at the same time that the revenue per employee has been declining. If we go to the Bloomberg terminal, we actually type in this, this great command called loss. Just type in IBM loss. And what you see is a list of all of the job cuts IBM. We can scroll through there. Oops, as I make my screen tiny. We can scroll through there deftly. And it gets, the list just goes on and on and on. But if you look at this chart, there's a circle every time they've whacked at the jobs. And what, what has happened to the stock price, as you can see, coming down over time, uh, even as they've been buying back shares, they've been cutting jobs. That's one other way to look and visualize those job cuts. You would have thought the share price would tick up if they're taking out costs, but maybe well, not. And, and, and lowering the number of shares out there. So earnings per share gets higher. And even then, it hasn't helped a ton. Uh, let's take it out to Foxconn, Tim. You've put out a great piece on Bloomberg Gadfly. And here, you're not perhaps buying all the PR around what seems to be a deal coming from Foxconn and touting that Apple might support them in building this, this big factory here in the United States. Right, and one of the big things that we need to understand is that uh, Foxconn uh, chairman Terry Gore on the weekend actually pointed out that it's a wish and it's not a promise. That's a really important caveat from uh, the billionaire chairman of Foxconn because he's uh, made uh, governments around the world believe that maybe he might possibly in the future invest in their countries but has not always followed through. You can't always blame him for that because often it's the, uh, the governments and the officials in those governments getting a little bit ahead of themselves. But Terry Gore has been very uh, patient but also very aggressive in going around to various governments around the world and saying, hey, you want me in your backyard? You've got to offer incentives. And he said that very clearly at the weekend at their year-end party that he will be talking to various state governments in the US looking for the best deal he can get and if the economics works out that means tax incentives cheap land you know electricity water all those things that cost money if he can get the good deal then sure he'll consider it he says you know it'd be mad not to consider it tit for tat it would seem it's not all one way for Donald Trump. D David weigh in here and give us your view on all this PRing and whether they're just CEOs are learning a new way to have to address job hirings and firings. Well, we are living in a world where appearances seem to matter more than ever, uh, and sometimes more than facts. You know, in terms of Foxconn's building a plant in the U.S., I think it's a very interesting possibility for several reasons. For one thing, it would be politically hugely advantageous for Apple if they could point to a considerable amount of their own sourcing coming from the U.S. Uh, from a very prominent plant. Uh, as Tim points out, you know, these are auctions, basically, where companies are bidding, asking people to bid for their business. And from Foxconn's point of view, it only helps them to have these reports out there. But ironically, in my opinion, you know, a plant like this is so automated today that increasingly these companies really don't care where it is and in the past they might have needed it to be in China because it was a very heavily labor intensive business but increasingly it will not be labor intensive and so I don't think we're talking nearly about the number of jobs that have been bandied about around this possible deal and and I think it really is a matter of where they get the incentives it's not about labor costs anymore because automation is what determines the success of these plants.
And I think that you know one of the reasons these things were made in China is because the labor was so cheap. They created a, a manufacturing process that was very labor intensive because labor was so cheap it didn't make sense to put it in machines. But but as as the cost of labor has risen in China, we've seen across all industries there's more use of automation. It would have happened in any other part of the country. To David's point, um, you, and, and 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 that that worldwide decline in the number of manufacturing jobs is something that even alternative facts probably can't rescue us from, but is an important issue uh, in the politics. I think this story cannot be divorced from the politics, whether it's a Foxconn story or the IBM story. Staying with the new Trump administration, one important issue for tech under Obama that looks like it may actually continue under President Trump is Obama's tech surge. The organized insertion of technologists and digital tools into the highest branches of federal government. Bloomberg's head of global technology coverage, Brad Stone, joined us to explain. The tech surge, right, the question is who will Trump appoint to succeed Megan Smith as CTO? Can Trump draw the same kind of bipartisan group of technologists to keep the effort going? But on the policy side, you're right, there are plenty of questions, you know, the new FCC uh, chair, uh, sorry, the uh, FTC chair, or FCC chair seems to be uh, very much against yeah. net neutrality, that's uh -huh. worrying to some in Silicon Valley. All these other issues where you know Silicon Valley politically differs from the administration, even at the same time as they look forward to things like tax holidays and a lower corporate tax rate. Interesting you say Silicon Valley differ well differs from Washington in some respects. We've just fascinating what's going on on Twitter, which we'll dig into in a moment. But Elon Musk actually tweeting a Bloomberg reporter right here, that being Dan Ahol, and he's saying that Rex Tillerson, he seems to be backing Rex Tillerson. Here we have it saying Rex is an exceptionally competent executive, understands geopolitics, and knows how to win for his team. His team is now the USA. Elon Musk really starting to get into bed with this new administration. We look at Twitter being deployed, but it's still being deployed very heavily by Donald Trump as well. Does that surprise you? Uh, no, I mean, that has been his primary communication mechanism for, very, for, for so long. It was effective for him uh, during the campaign. It's yeah. obviously sort of a mouthpiece directly to the people as he sees it. Um, of course, the masses aren't quite on tr Twitter or embracing it, but nevertheless, it allows him to get an unfiltered message out there. And with Elon's tweet, you know, I think we're seeing him and some other business leaders uh, take, take more of a role in the administration or at least see the opportunity to come in and uh, get their policy priorities passed in this new environment. So uh, I think there's some, there's some uh, cautious outreach on both sides, and Twitter, of course, is the venue of choice. And will it be adopted more wide-scale social media outlets such as Twitter by other politicians? Are they going to take a leaf out of his book here? I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, Trump is pretty singular in his ability to get attention via tweet. You know, he's sort of, uh, he, 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 he tweets impetuously, let's say. It's not really in the character of many other politicians. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I think he's somewhat unique. We also looked at whether this is good for Twitter, and, yeah. and, fr and frankly, I don't know that it is. For more on what Trump's tweet means for Twitter and democracy, catch the latest episode of our podcast, Decrypted. You can find new episodes on iTunes every Tuesday. Coming up, online pharmacy Pillpack is aiming to shake up the pharmacy business by improving how drugs are packaged. We visit the pharmaceutical startup's headquarters next. This is Bloomberg. Spending on prescription drugs in the U.S. hit a record $425 billion last year, and demand for pharmacy services is growing as the U.S. population ages. And yet, 50% of all Americans fail to take their frequently complex drug combinations correctly. Online pharmacy startup PillPack sees an opportunity to simplify the process. Bloomberg's Donny Bloomfield visited the startup's headquarters in Somerville, Massachusetts. <laughs> Pillpack is taking on the neighborhood pharmacy. At a traditional retail pharmacy, it's all around individual prescriptions, right? They don't think about the overall value of a consumer. The online pharmacy has a different approach. Instead of having seven or eight different bottles, you get one of these boxes. That box is delivered to a customer every few weeks. Pills are sorted into individual packets by the time and date they should be taken. So this one's for 8 a.m., you have one for 12 p.m. and one for 8 p.m. CEO and co-founder TJ Parker is focused on the 30 million Americans that take five or more prescriptions a day. They're ultimately the highest value customer in the market. Parker launched PillPack in 2014, and now with roughly $120 million in funding. So we've gone from about 200 people a year ago to north of 600 today. PillPack has a new headquarters in Somerville, Massachusetts. 
and a recently expanded 50,000 square foot distribution warehouse in Manchester, New Hampshire. Here robots help sort pills, and the majority of PillPack's employees handle refills, claims, shipping, and program its online tools. How hard would it be for an Express Scripts or a Walgreens or another player to just replicate that exact model? The filling system, the clinical system, the, the sort of automation, all of that had to be built from scratch. You now these are 50, 100 billion dollar companies. So if they decided that they had to build an equivalent of PillPack, they could certainly do it. It's just gonna take a long time. But Bloomberg intelligence analyst Jonathan Palmer sees little reason for the big players to mimic PillPack's model. So they've got their work cut out for them if they really want to uh, tackle all this problem and uh, push CVS and Walgreens kind of off the pedestal. There's about $425 billion spent in the U.S. on the third prescription drugs. That's 5.6 billion 30-day prescriptions. So 90% of that is going to the retail corner pharmacy. And just like those competitors, PillPack labels itself an online retail pharmacy, not simply a mail order service. This is not a regulatory definition, this is a business definition that varies amongst PBMs and payers and, and pharmacies. Um, we do not, as a new ent entity and a new type of service model, fit in any of the existing buckets particularly well. That distinction was at the center of PillPack's recently resolved public contract dispute with Express Scripts. Most prescriptions in the U.S. are managed by prescription benefit managers. CVS Caremark, United Health's OptumRx, and Express Scripts. Typically, mail order pharmacies are reimbursed at a much lower rate than a, than a retail pharmacy or a specialty pharmacy for dispensing a prescription. So my guess is that PillPack uh, wants to get the dispensing fee that's at a higher rate than the traditional mail order rate that, that we see out there. The dispute put more than one third of PillPack sales at risk. Certainly part of that, uh, that negotiation was around rates, but that was not the core negotiation. The core negotiation was, do consumers ultimately have the, the ability to choose what pharmacy they want to use? And that's the reason we fought that battle. Another battle is to help patients failing to take drugs as they're told. According to the New England Healthcare Institute, it costs the U.S. nearly $300 billion a year. There's a handful of startups doing sort of same-day delivery, sort of Instacart for pharmacy, um, but we think that's a very different solution. We don't think the, the secret sauce of PillPack is delivery. It's, if you talk to consumers, it's not the core problem that they face. PillPack's goal is to make taking pills easy, and that might help patients take their meds on time. Donnie Bloomfield, Bloomberg News, Somerville, Massachusetts. Now, a story to leave you with, a disturbance in the force at Disney this week can be described in one word, excitement. That's after the announcement of the next installment in the Star Wars saga, Episode 8, will be titled Star Wars The Last Jedi. The Star Wars spin-off Rogue One, released last month, has passed the $1 billion mark at the global box office, according to Disney. The Last Jedi will hit US theaters on December the 17th. Now that does it for this edition of Best of Bloomberg Technology. Next week, we have a terrific lineup of exclusive interviews, including conversations with Drew Houston, CEO of Dropbox, and Stuart Butterfield, CEO of Slack. Tune in each day at 5 p.m. New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco, and 6 a.m. in Hong Kong. Remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. It's at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.